Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Little Bumble Bear's Let's Play. I'm Kristen, and we're back with another Microsoft Learning Program. This is Microsoft Dogs. In the previous uh, episodes of this series, I have done Dangerous Creatures and Oceans, both amazingly fun, chocked full of knowledge and facts. I highly recommend you go check those out. But yes, in this one, we'll be learning about our wonderful canine friends, I will share with you guys that I did have a beautiful husky for 13 years named Kaya, and she was the only dog I ever owned and the greatest pet I had ever had. I had cats and goldfish and I think even a guinea pig at one point, and there was nothing like my dog. Um, but yeah, she passed away because she was just getting old, um, and she had arthritis problems, so I miss her. She passed away in the summer of 2022, so uh, last year. Well, yeah, it's, it's almost been a year in a few months, probably. So I dedicate this to you, Kaya. All right, we're going to begin. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below. And please, if you're new, why not subscribe for more awesome learning content and nostalgic gaming? Uh, check out the playlist in the description box, because, yes, I did finally uh, figure out a playlist to put all these in. I'm calling it the Microsoft Learning Games even though these are technically software, but you know, there's still actually like little mini games in the game, so I'm, I'm still gonna consider it a game. Uh, but yeah, there's a playlist down below, go check those out. I got Dangerous Creatures and Oceans in there and I'll be adding more. Uh, I have a uh, Twitter and Instagram you can follow and a streaming channel if you wanna catch me when I go live. And I have a Discord server open to everyone, so if you use Discord, please join, come in, say hi, chat with us, or maybe post some funny memes. It's a really great little uh, tight-knit community that I enjoy running. Okay. Oh, yes. As I've said in the previous videos, we'll be starting with the guides because they touch on a lot of the content in this game in a very fun way with their narrations and their facts. So we're going to start with the guides. But, of course, I will individually go to each section. Um, and there'll be timestamps so you can find everything easily. Uh, okay. Please enjoy. <laughs> You know, running an employment agency for dogs isn't easy. When my husband, Bernard, may he rest in peace, came up with this idea 20 years ago, I thought he was nuts. I gotta admit, though, it's worked out better than I expected. I mean, you'd be surprised how many jobs there are out there for dogs. If you click on my picture in the corner, I'll show you what's hot and what's not in the canine working world. In a business like this, you're always on the lookout for new talent. For instance, I had a Samoyed in here the other day with great references. Her family's been in the reindeer herding business for over 500 years. But that's just a drop in the bucket when you figure herders have been around for at least 10,000 years. Fact is, flock herders and guardians were probably the first kinds of dogs early humans domesticated. Tribe.
The history of herding and sheepdogs can be traced as far back as 1000 BC, when farmers began to breed large numbers of sheep and cattle. Although different varieties of herding dogs emerged, they all were hardworking, loyal, and intelligent, qualities they still possess today. Of course, once people settled down and started raising crops and livestock, they suddenly had a lot to lose. Before long, everybody was declaring war on everybody else. Back then, nobody had guns, but dogs with spears or pots of boiling oil strapped to their backs could do an awful lot of damage to the enemy. During World War II, the Russian army had the same idea when they trained dogs to run with bombs on their backs under enemy tanks. German shepherds go through a refresher course after arrival in Vietnam. They've been used successfully as scouts and for sentry duty following stateside training. So extensive has been the use of these dogs that many have been wounded and a few killed in action. Ancient hunters didn't have guns, which is why they first developed sight hounds to run down game. Of course, with all the firepower you got out there today, there's not much call anymore for fast dogs outside of the dog track. But if a dog is willing to relocate, there are still some places in the not-so-industrialized world where sighthounds are used for hunting. And I don't mean mechanical rabbits. Pariah. Like most canines, these African hunting dogs live and hunt in a pack. Their large ears help them hear audio cues from each other during the hunt. Working together like this means there'll be plenty of food for all members of the pack. But if the hunting sighthound market is shrinking, the entertainment field is booming. These days, of course, everybody wants a movie contract, or at least a TV show. But in the old days, the circus was where it was at. Back then, poodles and bichon frises got most of the pots. Maybe because they were willing to cut their hair to match the clown's pom-poms. Guardian breeds. If you can teach a dog to roll over, can you teach it to do a backflip? Well, maybe not, 
but the same basic training principles still apply. Not that acting in a movie is a piece of cake. No, no, no. I got a call last week from a producer looking for a dog to fight a wolf. Now, that sounds dangerous, right? But it's really not. Everything in the movie is a combination of camera work and careful training. I'd never send my clients out on a real fight. But some people aren't so scrupulous. Dog fighting is still big business all over the world, even where it's not legal. Away from you, catch up just a half step, drop back as he cuts in front of you. Good boy. With their instincts to work cooperatively in a social unit, that's it, good boy. Dogs are natural born helpers. Go on, go on, boy. By capitalizing on these instincts, humans can teach dogs to be the eyes, ears, and even hands for people who need them. And speaking of jobs that could be hazardous to your health, take a look at Laika, the Russian cosmodog. Poor thing went up, but she never came down. Or how about all those beagles being bred for medical research? Some people say animal experimentation is a necessary evil. Other folks think there's no excuse for it. But wherever you stand on the issue, you got to admit, science careers are usually pretty tough on dogs. Not in a business like this, you're all a f but if the h not that acting in a m and speaking of jobs that could be Borzoi. What does it take to chase down a wolf? Speed and stamina. Wolf coursing was once the national sport of Russia. And only the swiftest and strongest dogs were up to the challenge. In my business, you run across all kinds. Sled dogs, for instance, they tend to be real workaholics. They're just not happy unless they're out there in freezing weather, hauling a heavy sled for hundreds of miles with just a couple of kibble breaks along the way. Hey, I couldn't do it, but it takes all kinds.
Jumping out of airplanes might not be the most typical job for a dog, but canines have been performing different kinds of rescue operations for hundreds of years. The job market being what it is, it pays to be flexible. Some breeds are better at it than others, though, like German Shepherds. Believe me, you don't want to be up against a German Shepherd for a job. These dogs are experts at just about everything. Police work, guiding the blind. Why, in Switzerland, they even aced St. Bernard's out of the search and rescue business. German Shepherd Dog. During World War II, moviegoers got a glimpse of the German Shepherd's remarkable qualities through a canine star named Rin Tin Tin. Today, the German Shepherd continues to prove itself as one of the most versatile working dogs ever developed. Its intelligence and strength make it invaluable to police forces all over the world. Yep, if there's one thing I've learned over the years, it's the importance of flexibility. Labrador retrievers, Doberman pinches, poodles, to name a few, can learn to do almost anything, short of figuring out your income tax. But some breeds are specialists. You'd never ask a podiatrist to perform heart surgery, so don't expect a basset hound to do the laundry. Basset Hound. Fortunately, there'll always be work for a good scent hound. Just last week, I got a dog a job with a truffle hunter over in France. Now, I don't mean those little chocolate candies. I'm talking fungus with a capital F. The things grow underground, and they cost a small fortune, like $60 or more an ounce. Sell a couple of pounds of those babies, and you can retire for the whole year. So a dog who can find them is worth its weight in, well, truffles. German wire-haired pointer.
pointers are generally hardworking and loyal. Hunters depend on pointers to freeze and point when they catch a scent. The dogs will stay in that position until they get the okay to move. Anything that expensive you ought to be able to wear. Okay, so maybe I'd look stupid with a couple of mushrooms hanging from my ears, but some people can wear anything. I take these Dalmatians, polka dots no less. If those dogs weren't so good looking, they might have been out of a job when gas engines replaced horse-drawn fire wagons. Nowadays, they're mostly just mascots. Nice work if you can get it, as my husband Bernard, may he rest in peace, used to say. Oh, sorry, hon. Gotta take this call. Feel free to click on the contents button and poke around on your own. Or you can click on my picture to get back to another guided tour. Dalmatian. Desdemona's Dogs Unlimited. We guarantee more bark for your buck. Can I help you? A dog that quacks like a duck. Well, let me look through my files. No, no, no. Sorry. No quacking dogs. Hey, how about a dog that looks like a raccoon? They're great with trash. Well, if you want something that quacks like a duck, I suggest you try a duck. Oh, you're welcome. Goodbye. Call any time. Sheesh. The calls I get around here, you would not believe. The stories I could tell. Like what, you ask? Well, hon, pull up a chair and click my picture in the corner. I'll give you the lowdown on some of my weirdest clients. When I said I had a dog that looked like a raccoon, I wasn't kidding. No joke, that really is a dog. The thing is, sometimes you can't tell the players without a scorecard. Uh, what I mean is, there are animals that look like dogs, but aren't. Hyenas, for example. And other animals that don't look like dogs, but are. Like my friend here, the raccoon dog. The Aztecs ate hairless dogs? Ew. Today, puffin nests are off limits. But at one time, raiding them used to be a job for this dog. The Norwegian Lundhound 
or puffin dog, is a six-toed, double-jointed wonder. Because it's bred to be able to reach into tight crevices, even its neck is double-jointed, allowing the head to bend almost all the way back. And then you got dogs that look like dust mops. Remind me to find out who does this guy's hair so I'll never go there. Seriously, there's only a handful of breeds in the world that have coats like this, and all of them are flock guardians. Believe it or not, it takes hours of work to achieve this particular look. Up to eight hours just to blow dry the cords after a bath. Talk about your bad hair days. Kuvas. The thick white coat of the Kuvas is as practical as it is beautiful. The Commodore's unique coat is also extremely practical. While guarding sheep, this dog could never be mistaken for a predator. Imagine a predator getting its teeth through these locks. Some dogs never have to worry about their hair because they don't have any. I know what you're gonna say. These American hairless terriers look like baby pigs, right? But they grow on you after a while, and you wouldn't believe how many calls I get from people looking for a hairless breed. The advantage of dogs like these is no hair on the mission-style couch, and no fleas in the Persian rug. The disadvantage is finding sweaters small enough to fit. These pups get cold really easy. Dog shows are a good way to see a wide variety of breeds, all in top form. Whether you're looking for a companion, a guardian, or even a helper, there's a canine size, shape, and personality to fit your home. Like I said, hairless dogs are an acquired taste. And in some parts of the world, we're not just talking metaphorically. In Central and South America, people like the Aztecs and Incas used to eat their hairless dogs on special occasions. And there are plenty of places in Asia today where dogs, and not just the naked ones either, are a popular item on the menu.
Sometimes called the Chinese fighting dog, the Shar Pei is an unusual looking dog, probably best known for its loose and wrinkled skin. For a fighting dog, this skin was very useful. Other dogs had a hard time sinking their teeth into it. Hey, now, don't get yourself in a lather. These dogs are guests at this particular meal, not the main course. After 20 years in this business, I gotta tell you, people can get pretty wacky when it comes to their dogs. I mean, your basic canine thinks snacking out of a trash can is just great, but these dogs' owner takes them to a five-star restaurant, probably drops a bundle on some souped-up kibble which the dogs don't even have the taste buds to appreciate. Throughout history, dogs have held important positions as helpers in human society. And although many people still view them as invaluable workers, others see them simply as the best possible playmates, especially when they're one short for the cricket match. And that's not all. You think these poodles asked to be tie-dyed? And how about that cowboy suit on the Afghan? I can only imagine the get-ups those dogs' owners are wearing. But the great thing about dogs, from the human perspective anyway, is that they'll put up with just about anything, so long as they're with their owner. Poodle. Its unique style may stop the show, but it's the poodle's disposition that makes it popular. With its inherent devotion and intelligence, this poodle terrier cross is more than a pet. It's a valuable service dog that helps people get out on their own. I mean, in 28 years of matrimonial bliss, my husband Bernard, may he rest in peace, never managed to get me higher than the seventh floor of the Empire State Building. <laughs> Look, I get vertigo standing on two-inch heels. But this German Shepherd is actually hang gliding. You can't tell me that dog woke up one morning and said to himself, Hey, think I'll jump off a cliff today. <laughs> no, only a human would think up a crazy stunt like that. Anthropomorphize. Thank <laughs> you. 
Throughout history, pets have taken on some very unanimal-like characteristics. It's easy to see, just as dogs think of humans as other dogs. Some humans think of their pets as, well, almost human. Now, canine frisbee is an idea I can get behind. Of course, the way I play frisbee, it's more like bowling. But I see these guys in the park with their dogs all the time. And let me tell you, it takes real talent and practice to do what they do. You know, there are even competitions. As a matter of fact, I went to the National Dog Frisbee Championships last year, looking for new talent. I met a bull terrier there that has real potential. A cell. Maybe you think people treating their dogs like humans is a phenomenon of modern life. But the fact is, hun, it's been going on for a long, long time. You know, Chinese emperors used to treat their Pekingese better than their slaves. Slave women even killed their own babies so they could nurse the newborn puppies instead. And in Egypt, people used to mummify their dogs when they died. Everybody in the family went into mourning, just as if their pet had been human. Akita. Spitz. But I think even the ancients might have raised an eyebrow just a little if they'd known about Bosco. Who's Bosco, you ask? He was elected mayor of Sonol, California, back in the 80s, and he just happened to be a Labrador retriever. That dog ran in five elections and was never defeated. A dog in public office, sheesh. Actually, on second thought, it might not be such a bad idea. A German shepherd named Rin Tin Tin hit the big screen during World War II. As movie audiences soon discovered, when it came to sniffing out trouble, Rin was the dog for the job. Wait, Bob! Let him go! What's left of him belongs to the law. Take him off! Come on, Rin! Come here! Come on, Rin! That's a boy! <laughs> yes, he's a good old Rin! But why they had to dress him up in a shirt and tie for his official portrait, I don't know. Now, Thierry Pons Lay's paintings of dogs in historical costumes, I can understand. That's art. And we all expect artists to be a little wacky, right? Besides, everybody knows art imitates life. And even people who don't dress up their dogs still think they're almost human. I don't get the duck thing, though. Dog is a duck. Hey, wait a minute. I wonder if that dog can quack. 
Excuse me, hon, but I gotta call a man about a duck. A, a dog. If you want, you can just keep browsing on your own by clicking on the contents button. Or click on my picture to start another guided tour. Why, Mer Honor? Yeah, yeah, bottom line, if he helps you get the bird, he gets the feet. It's in his contract. Hey, next time, read the fine print. Sorry for the interruption. Some people just don't realize that sporting types aren't like the rest of us. That guy on the phone, for instance goes bird hunting with a Finnish spitz, violates the dog's contract by not giving it the kill's feet, then can't figure out why the dog won't hunt for him again. Like I said, athletes are different. Click on that button in the corner with my picture on it and I'll show you what I mean. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it would be pretty unusual to find a professional hockey player who's also great at basketball and tennis. Well, it's the same with dogs. A fine gun dog, like an English setter, would make a lousy fox hunter, and vice versa. Basically, the canine sporting world is divided up between gun dogs, hounds, terriers, and then what I like to call the miscellaneous class. But I'll tell you more about that later. English setter. I'll tell you straight off, the term gun dog is a little misleading. I mean, most of these guys have been around since the days when people hunted birds with nets and falcons. And just because they're all lumped into the same category, don't make the mistake of thinking all gun dogs are alike. You got your retrievers, your pointers, your setters, your spaniels, and your water dogs to choose from. Some dogs just specialize in one thing. Others are generalists. You gotta know what you're looking for. Flat-coated retriever. For instance, you might ask, what's the difference between a water dog and a retriever? I mean, they both go in the water, right? 
Not necessarily so. Back in the old days, British hunters liked to divvy up the work between two or three dogs. They used pointers to find game, land retrievers, like labs and goldens, to bring back birds on dry ground, and water retrievers, like the Irish water spaniel, to go after birds that fell in the water. Of course, these days, many land retrievers do water retrieval as well. Chesapeake Bay Retriever. And then you got to decide who's going to do all the legwork, a pointer, a setter, or a spaniel. Pointers and setters pretty much do both the same job. They show you where a bird is hiding without scaring it off. In the days before guns, this was a great thing. Hunters could sneak up with their nets and catch the birds before they knew what was happening. Pointers were bred to hunt like wolves. When they smell their prey, they freeze and point. But setters are probably descended from herding dogs, and so they crouch down low and creep towards their target, like it was a sheep. Field Spaniel Now, a spaniel is a whole different kettle of fish. These dogs really got popular after guns were invented, and hunters found they liked the challenge of shooting birds on the wing. What you need for that kind of sport is a dog that'll not only find the bird for you, but also drive it out of hiding. So if you were wondering why your spaniel is so, shall we say, springy, <laughs> just remember, these dogs were bred to scare the daylights out of birds by jumping at them from nowhere. English Springer Spaniel. Springer Spaniels are indefatigable hunting dogs, even in the backyard. This pup might not know what she's looking for, but it doesn't look like she'll stop until she finds it. Now, just about anybody can go bird hunting. 
All you need is a gun and a dog that knows what it's doing. But fox hunting requires a considerable cash outlay. You'll need horses, the fancy duds, all those English people, and a pack of dogs. Foxhounds, to be exact. Fox hunting used to be the exclusive pastime of the fancy rich, and it still is. The big difference now is that more and more clubs are following artificial scent trails instead of real live foxes. It's a win-win game. The dogs and the people have a great time, and the fox gets to stay home and stay alive. English Foxhound Organized fox hunting was first established in England in the 13th century. The dogs they used, foxhounds, are friendly, energetic dogs. Although they're generally not recommended as house pets, they do make excellent hunters. Whoa, get back. Going after one of these pussycats is not my idea of a good time. But I do occasionally get calls from big game hunters looking for the right dog. For bear, cougar, or lion, I usually recommend going with something like a coon hound or a Rhodesian Ridgeback. Dogs like these have cold noses, meaning they can follow an old trail. And they're big enough and brave enough to face even this big cat. Rhodesian Ridgeback. But even a lion might have second thoughts if he met up with an Irish wolfhound. Just look at this guy. He really is as big as a horse. This dog's business was hunting wolves, and he was almost too efficient for his own good. After all the wolves in Ireland were gone, the Irish wolfhound went to England and wiped out the entire population of Canis lupus over there. But once there were no more wolves, people didn't see much point in feeding such a big galoot and the breed nearly went extinct. Irish Wolfhound There is more evil around us here than I have ever encountered before. 
Well, I still don't see what... Mortimer's gone. His pony cart's not there. You told him to stay with Sir Henry. Well, indeed I did. Remember how I said athletes are different? I was thinking about terriers at the time. Fox hunting terriers, for instance. British fox hunters bred certain terriers, like the Jack Russell or the Border Terrier, to go underground after foxes that had escaped the hounds. Now you gotta figure any breed that's willing to go down a long, dark tunnel after a really, really desperate fox has gotta be long on guts and short on imagination. I mean, these dogs are fearless. Pointers are among the oldest sporting dogs and have assisted hunters for centuries. Unlike hunting dogs that flush out game, pointers stand like statues with one forefoot raised and muzzle pointed toward the quarry. Which is probably what put it in some sports-minded people's heads to cross terriers with bulldogs to create the Arnold Schwarzenegger of canines, a dog that would fight and kill its own kind. And just in case you think this kind of thing doesn't go on anymore, I'm here to tell you that even where it's illegal, dog fighting is still a big money sport. It's situations like this makes me wonder what dogs ever saw in us humans in the first place. American Staffordshire Terrier. Remember that miscellaneous class I mentioned? Well, I guess you could include greyhounds in this group. A long time ago, hunters used these dogs to catch rabbits. They'd send a greyhound out with a pointer. You see, the pointer would find the rabbits, and the greyhound would catch them. But these days, the only rabbits most greyhounds see are mechanical ones at the dog track. You'd be amazed how much money there is in dog racing. Too bad the dogs don't see any of it. Greyhound.
The sleek and powerful Greyhound is the fastest of dogs. Along with whippets, they're the number one choice for dog racing in stadiums all over the world. And speaking of races, how about that Iditarod? I mean, any dog that's going to pull a sled for over a thousand miles across a frozen tundra has got to be in dynamite shape. If I lived on my treadmill for a hundred years, I'd never even come close. I guess you could say that sled dogs are long-distance runners and greyhounds are sprinters. But one thing they do have in common is their short careers. You won't find many dogs over five years old at the track or in the traces. Oh my gosh, look at the time. I got a meeting in five minutes with two Corker dogs and a Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever. Listen, make yourself at home. Click on the contents button and look around on your own if you want. Or if you'd rather try another tour, just click on my picture to get back to the guide screen. Now, my dog, Kaya, was an Alaskan Husky, not a Sib Siberian Husky. Um, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, she, she didn't look quite like this. She was Alaskan. She had very uh, soft, more like a cream color than a white. Um, she was cream, and she had beautiful blue eyes, and her fur was the softest fur I'd ever felt on any dog I ever knew. Um... So, but yes, this, this is my Kaya page right here. <laughs> Yeah, she had a fur color more similar to this dog right here. This dog has some darker tones in the back though, but more of that cream colored look, I guess. Siberian Husky. Welcome, welcome. I'm Charles Dogwin, and you're from the colonies, aren't you? Do excuse the mess. I'm trying to write up my theories and publish them before some young pup beats me to the punch. And this is my colleague, Spin. <laughs> Little joke. He's a dog, as you can see, not a young one. Good fellow, though, never contradicts me. Oh, Sir Charles, have you had kippers for breakfast? I pride myself on my nose. And I do correct Sir Charles. He thinks out loud, you know. When he gets off the beam, I run to the door and bark for a walk. <coughs> that usually sets him straight. Uh, click on that picture of us in the corner, and he'll tell you all about his trip. Her Majesty's ship, Beagle. Ah, that was a boat. Sailed round the world, we did. I spent the last 20 years thinking about what I saw in those five. Strange fauna. Turtles, butterflies, animals that carry their young about in pouches. But what really teased my brain was a humbler species. Dogs! They're everywhere! Oh, he's just like a puppy when he gets excited. I'm of the Italian extraction myself. Nothing surprises a Spinone. Kerry Blue Terrier.
Young as I was, I signed on HMS Beagle as ship's naturalist. Not always a reputable profession. Back in the Middle Ages, they thought animals were made up of bits and pieces of... other animals. No concept of species until Linnaeus came along. Um, where was I? Linnaeus, in case you don't remember, is that human fellow who decided everything in the world had to have a name and a classification. Silly, eh? If you can't recognize a tree without a handbook, you might as well stay home. Dogs. That's it. You can't grow up British and not know dogs. My grandfather kept foxhounds. As a lad, I rode with the hunt. Had a fine time as long as I didn't think too much about the fox. Then there are the terriers and the great hounds. Of course, a lot of those British dogs are really imports. It makes sense to study a subject close at hand. And what species is closer to us, really, than our dogs? English Foxhound. We English even characterize ourselves in terms of dogs. You know our national mascot, homely but tenacious. Um, what was my point? Oh yes, I was scarcely out of short pants when I began to be fascinated by the incredible diversity within the canine population. So many dogs, so like, and yet so different. What makes it so? If he ever figures that one out, they'll know his name a hundred years from now. Bulldog. One holiday, my family went to the Shetland Islands. The collies there are half the size of those in Scotland. Of course, the stock they herd is just as tiny. It's quite like landing in Lilliput. Even as a boy, I had to wonder. Sir Charles read Gulliver's Travels out loud to Mrs. D. Good story. I like the dogs in Brobdignag. Shetland Sheepdog. What makes a dog a dog, besides having a remarkable tolerance for us humans, that is? Oh, there's nothing like a voyage around the world to enlarge one's point of view. A dog, according to Linnaeus, is a member of the family Kennedy, not to be confused with the British colony in North America. A dog is a carnivorous mammal. A dog is one of nature's great achievements. Or was it man's? Um, hmm.
When it comes to adapting to its environment, the Arctic fox is a lesson in survival. Its short furry ears help prevent heat loss, and during the winter, its brown fur turns into a thick white coat. Because food is scarce, the Arctic fox can travel great distances looking for its next meal. If I'd never left home, I might have said all dogs were furry beasts like my friend Spin here. Not so. It was in South America I saw my first hairless dog, bald as can be, and said to be quite tasty. <coughs> uh, take it easy, old chap. Take it easy. No one's going to eat you. <laughs> Not yet, at least. <laughs> You'd almost think he understood what we were saying. <laughs> Raccoon hunting was once a top sport in many parts of the southeastern United States. Coon hounds could follow a trail for hours, covering large areas of countryside. Their job was done only when the raccoon had nowhere else to go. It turns out that they eat dogs in China, too. They have their own breeds of hairless dogs, but they also eat great furry ones. I'm no linguist, but I'd have to guess the slang word <clears throat> chow derives from the unfortunate pooch that serves as the main course. <laughs> You'll note that dogs don't eat humans. Even a wolf won't, unless it's quite literally starving. To be honest, I find this whole conversation to be in very, very poor taste. <laughs> Me too. Chow chow. Eczema. China, Japan, and Tibet each has its version of the little lion dog. Look a bit like sky terriers. Since the lion is sacred to Buddha, these little pups get treated very well indeed. The monks in Tibet put Lhasa Apsos inside their robes. Keeps everybody warm. That suit you better, does it spin? Extraordinary country, Tibet. The Himalayas are almost higher than the English imagination soars. It's a cold, lonely business keeping sheep in those mountains. I hope you appreciate how soft your life is, Spin. He likes it when I lick his hand. Uh, good fellow. Where was that handkerchief? Tibetan Terrier.
Dogs down under work hard, too. The outback is so vast and rugged, they have to. Australian cowboys say one border collie is worth two men on horseback. Border collies come from Scotland, actually. They're the only dogs brave or silly enough to perform well in that dreadful climate. Australian Kelpie A herding dog rounds up sheep that have strayed from the main flock. Trained to obey signals, a dog like this is invaluable to its owner. Not only is it able to travel over long distances every day, but figures show it can do the work of six humans. In North Africa, the desert is so vast, humans would never taste a bit of meat without their hounds to catch it for them. Desert dogs have very short coats, as you might expect, and very big ears to keep them cool. With dogs in the far north, it's just the opposite. Provocative, isn't it? Mm, no smells coming from the kitchen are even more provocative. Mm -hmm. Saluki. Even with spectacles on, we people only see what's in front of our noses. But a gaze hound's eyesight is a piece of work. A man has to turn halfway around to see what a dog sees out of the corners of its eyes. Oh dear, there's Mrs. Dogwin calling us to tea. Charming woman, delightful girl. Well, come along then. <coughs> I'll save you a bit of tea cake. Shall I spin old chap, old dog you? A dog's body is designed for the chase, capture, and killing of its prey, maintaining great stamina over long distances. When dogs swim, they're actually running underwater. They use their front legs as paddles, just like many children do when they're first learning to swim.
thanks, but I'd rather have some raw beef. I am a carnivore. <laughs> now, that was the short tour. You didn't get to hear about the yodeling African Basenji or the blue tick coon hound over in the colonies who sings when he trees his prey, or the Tosa Inu, or oh, so many dogs, so little time. Well, here's a world you can tour by yourself. When you're done, click the contents button if you'd like to explore. Or if you want to take another guided tour, click our picture. Chien. Woof woof. Dog. Woof woof. Perro. Wow wow. Cachorro. Wow wow. Wuru. Woof woof. Mboa. Woo woo. Kelp. Kelev, hav hav. Kane, bau bau. Hund, bau bau. Chien, woof. Dog, woof woof. Madra, uff uff. Hund. Woof woof. Sabaka. Gav gav. Kutta. Ba ba. Go. Wang wang. Inu. Wow wow. Aso. Ow 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 ow. Nai. Wow, wow. Dog, wolf. Shh. Sir Charles is napping. He's been reading that fellow Malthus again. Funny how humans think they can learn about the world from books. I tried one once when I was just a pup, but there wasn't much to it. I was hungry again in an hour. <sighs> Inheritance of beneficial traits. The fact is, if you want to know about a dog, just ask a dog. I'll just lie down on his feet so they won't get cold. Oh, I'm so fond of him, really. For a human, he's quite intelligent. You might say they're a hobby of mine, humans. If you'll just click that picture up in the corner, I'll tell you all about them. One thing you have to understand about humans is they're a restless lot, always moving from one place to another. Sir Charles keeps wondering how it is we dogs turn up all over the world in more or less the same condition. But the answer is simple, really. We came with you. Some of us became sailors. Bichon frisé. And some jump ship. There's a breed on Malta, that's a tiny little island of Italy, that still looks just like their great 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 grandparents. Well, you get the picture. They sailed from Egypt eons ago, like the looks of Malta, decided to stay. With no local dogs to mate with, they haven't changed a bit in all those years. Maltese.
It's no fun to be seasick, but the sailors had it easy. Some of us had to walk our way around the world. Land bridges connected the continents back then, and we dogs followed our humans right across them. Natural selection. <sighs> well, that's how the Spitzes got to Japan. Shiba Inu. And how those dashing dingoes ended up in Australia. Dingoes are different from your average modern dog. They've kept to the old ways more than most. Stay away from humans mostly and hunt their own food. They know how to keep their mouths shut too. They hardly ever bark. <coughs> Listen to that, would you? You'd almost think he was trying to bark. Humans call it the New World, even though it's just as old as all the rest. We walk there too, and a big wild country it is, two continents worth. In the old times, the humans there were more hunters than herders, so they didn't have as much use for us as some folks, except sometimes when they got hungry. How did wild wolves like these ever come to be pets in our homes? The answer is instincts. Wolves' instincts tell them the best way to survive is to live and work together in a pack. Dogs simply accept humans as their pack members. Believe it or not, those herder guard dog twosomes you find all over Europe came from Tibet, walked every step of the way. And we're not talking about an afternoon promenade here, either. It took a couple of centuries and a lot of camping out. Those dogs can take it, though. They're tough. Tibetan Terrier. A dog that hooked up with the Romans had to be tough. Some humans just want to see the world, but the Romans wanted to own it. We're not talking about paying cash either. War is a uniquely human idea, and not such a good one if you ask me. Those Romans had us drive cattle for their armies. They strapped spears to us and sent us into battle. On their days off, they made us fight each other. Evidently, they found it more entertaining than we did.
Irish Terrier. I don't suppose I'll ever understand how humans pick their leaders. Now we dogs sort it out while we're just pups. The best dog leads the pack, and if a better dog comes along, well, it takes over. But for a big stretch of human history, it was getting born into the right family that made a king or queen. Had nothing at all to do with whether the person was up to the job. These African hunting dogs are another close relative of our domestic canines. Like domestic puppies, the young hunting dogs use playtime as a training ground. As adults, they live and hunt together in family groups. Take Marie Antoinette. She and her husband Louis ruled France, but they weren't very good leaders built themselves fancy palaces while the rest of their pack went hungry. Marie treated her dog well, royalty often did, but the ordinary people finally had enough, cut her head off. A good master is not always a good human. Papillon. Take the case of Russia. The Tsars and their noble friends go on wolf hunts that last two weeks or more. They take the train to where the wolves are, 40 cars full of food and wine and more to carry their hounds. Meanwhile, the peasants are starving. And who pays for it all? Hmm. Borzoi. The common folk, of course. Kings and queens get so desperate to find a way to pay for their pleasures, they even put taxes on dogs. Just ask an English sheepdog how it lost its tail. Mark my words, there's trouble coming to those czars. Whenever human leaders treat their pets better than their people, it spells revolution. Call it Spin's Law. Old English Sheepdog. This dog is showing off one of the trademarks of its breed, incredible energy. The stamina that made the Old English Sheepdog an excellent herder also makes it a lively and spirited pet.
And while I'm on my soapbox, there's another thing. Oh, oh, oh there you are, Spin. Good fellow. I've just had the most remarkable dream. I fell asleep pondering how one generation inherits traits from another, that sort of thing. And in my dream, I saw a sort of spiral staircase, or was it two entwined? <laughs> I was quite convinced I had the answer. <coughs> quite so, utter nonsense. If you want to explore, click the contents button or click the picture in the corner and you can take another tour. Boston Terrier. Hello there, do come in. Charles Dogwin here, and this is my delightful dog, Spin. Speak, Spin, and you shall have your cake. Oh, I wish you wouldn't do this when we have company. Come on, old fella. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Now, go lie down. That's good, boy. As I was saying, I'm convinced that nature must do something like we humans do when we breed animals. Take dogs. My study of dogs has convinced me there's some mechanism of heredity at work. Someday, perhaps, we'll understand just what it is. Click the picture of us in the corner and we'll discuss it. One thing my travels led me to suspect. The world must be much older than we're used to thinking. In the Nile Valley, I saw figures on the walls of caves that looked like they were drawn by little children. You have to wonder about the people who made them. Were they like us? And the dogs in them looked remarkably like the greyhounds you see racing at the English track. Could they be relatives? Greyhounds are about 9,000 years old, and they run about 45 miles per hour, as any of them will gladly tell you. Those fellows are ancient, fast, and uppity. Like most canines, these are... Take white dogs. For centuries, at least, humans have been breeding shepherds to look like sheep. The sheep take it as a compliment, and it fools the wolves. Perfectly sensible, really. But where did white dogs come from? The one there is, they're still around. Some of those guardians are so devoted to their flocks, they won't even take time off to mate with other dogs. Kuvas. In the far north, near the pole, Samoyeds are quite blindingly white. In fact, most sled dogs have white faces with a rim of black hair around the eyes. To cut the glare, one presumes. Thick, cozy coats. Inspired adaptations, really. Of course, the natives there have been breeding dogs for countless generations. My coat's barely adequate for England, never mind the North Pole. Up there, a dog needs a proper undercoat to keep it warm. But who's been breeding Arctic foxes or polar bears? Nature and humans seem to be in agreement on what survival gear is best suited to the climate. An animal that blends in with the landscape is less likely to get eaten than one that calls attention to itself, you know. I think it's time to call a little attention to myself. <coughs> not now, Spin. Hmm, Sir Charles believes dogs should be seen but not heard. Pomeranian.
Northern breeds are best known for their stamina and strength. But there's another side to these hardworking animals. With their energy and affectionate dispositions, they can be devoted pets, always ready for a new adventure. Now, in the desert, I met nomads who know as much about breeding dogs as any Englishman, and they keep it all in their heads. What they're breeding for is big lungs and long legs. Science has something to learn from folk wisdom, don't you think? Uh, science has a lot to learn, period. I mean, Sir Charles thinks what a dog learns in its life can be passed on to its puppies. If we spoke the same language, I'd set him straight. Once I paid a visit to La Vendée in France and spent some time chatting with a fellow who breeds griffins. Uh, griffins come in large and small sizes with long or short legs, you know. I asked them how they did it. And he said to me, eh, Happy accident, mon cher professeur. When a dwarf appeared in the litter, my ancestors saw the potential of a short-legged hand. Fine hunters, those griffins. Even the ones that travel low to the ground. They're descended from Spinones, you know. Bassett Griffin Von Dane. Griffins. The French make the best wine and the finest scent hounds. I've heard that after the, uh, <clears throat> the rebels won their uh, the revolution, Lafayette sent a brace of hounds to your What's his name? General uh, Washington. And American breeders knew talent when they saw it. Uh, but I digress. Ah, uh, the American coon hound is the opera singer of the dog world. I long to hear one bay before I die. Black and tan coon hound. Hounds were the first dogs to change the way humans could hunt for food. Some dogs were bred for great eyesight, others for an incredible sense of smell. Today, sight hounds and scent hounds are still popular sporting dogs all over the world. As long as anyone remembers, and collectively that's quite a long time, there's been five basic types of dog, each one quite useful to humans in its way. With those ingredients, we could cook up any kind of dog that walks the earth today. Take Spin here. He's got a hound nose, certainly, with a bit of mastiff and a bit of herder both mixed in. Uh, the mystery is where he got his bristly coat. Hedgehogs are bristly. My coat is wiry, thanks very much. A touch of terrier, perhaps. Our little English exterminators are Johnny's come lately in the dog world, I'm afraid. But they make themselves so useful. I'm sure they're here to stay. <laughs> 
Only as long as rats last. When the prey becomes extinct, the predator soon follows. Now just have a look at these fellows. All dogs, of course, but look at the difference in their muzzles and, and the placement of their eyes. Shows you how powerful selective breeding is. Almost a kind of, kind of sculpture done in flesh and bone. People seem to think that flat-faced dogs are fetching. They couldn't fetch uncooked spaghetti. I'm glad I have a proper muzzle. Pekingese. The time it takes to create a breed gets collapsed when one fellow sets out to make the perfect dog. Old Parson Jack Russell made himself a terrier, and so did Captain Edwards of Cilium. Makes one wonder if obsession isn't part of the English character. Those fellows just kept breeding for the traits they wanted till they got them. A breed isn't a breed until it breeds true all by itself, you know? If humans took more care with their own breeding, they'd be a better lot. Can you imagine having to walk around on only two legs all day long? West Highland White Terrier. Of course, one wonders what sort of dogs we'd have if we left them free to choose their own mates. I suppose you might say it's my obsession to try to figure out how nature goes about her business, hmm? The truth is, every purebred dog was once a mutt. <coughs> oh, Spin wants to go out, don't you, boy? <coughs> the neighbor's bearded collie comes in heat, and despite his age, Spin finds her quite enticing. <coughs> what is it they say about old dogs? <laughs> Old dogs are wiser than old humans. That's what dogs say. Here, have a look at this while I take Spin for his walk. Then you can click the contents button if you want to poke about on your own, or click our picture if you'd like to take another tour. Ta-ta! Yes, Dalmatian genes made Australian cattle dogs loyal to humans and friendly with horses. Yes, Sharpays and Chow Chows both have black tongues, suggesting common ancestors. Correct. Some experts believe the bloodhound was an ancestor of the golden retriever. Excellent. The puli is descended from the original herding dog, the Tibetan terrier. That's right. The English greyhound contributed to the Doberman's racy body. Correct. Pomeranians and elk hounds are both spitzes. One hundred years ago, palms were much larger. Right. Newfoundlands got their swimming skills and waterproof coats from Portuguese water dogs. Right. The white and bull terrier's coats came partly from Dalmatians. Yes. Pugs are miniature mastiffs. 
descended from the same stock as Great Danes. Hey, up here. When you've got a little sister, you need a secret place. It's always, Ben, will you play a game with me? Ben, how do you spell Mississippi? It makes me nuts. Anyhow, I promised I'd tell you how I became a dog nerd. I'm not a nerd, really, but I do know a lot about dogs. When my folks asked me what I wanted for my 13th birthday, see, I said a dog. I figured after they said no dog, I'd have a better chance of getting a motorbike. It's always worked before, only this year, they surprised me. This year, they said, do your homework, Ben, then tell us what kind of dog you want. Click that picture of me up in the corner, and I'll tell you what I learned. Dogs have four feet, they bark, and they wag their tails, right? Well, that's what I thought. But my mom's the kind of person who won't buy a new toaster without reading 14 back issues of Consumer Reports. She says, homework, you study up. I decided to start with the dog man. He's this old guy who's always walking about a million dogs in the park, right about the time baseball practice gets out. I've never talked to him before, but one night, I decided to catch up with him. Uh, excuse me, I said. I'm thinking about getting a new dog. How do you figure out which one's best? Busy streets and high-rise apartment buildings may not be the natural environment for dogs, but many breeds can adapt quite well to city living, as long as they get the right amount of exercise. And since exercise requirements differ from dog to dog, be sure to know what your pet needs. The dog man laughed. You should choose a dog as carefully as you'd pick a wife, he said. The way marriages go these days, the dog might be around longer. I said I wasn't planning to get married right away. I should hope not, the dog man said. What I mean is, you want to find a dog that fits you. Your personality, your family, your house, your life. I looked at the big bouquet of dogs he was holding by their leashes. I pointed at this black and tan one that sort of reminded me of a Porsche. He looks kind of cool, I said. They come in all shapes, sizes, and temperaments. Since taking on a dog is a lifetime commitment, choose one that fits your own lifestyle, whatever that may be. The Doberman, the dog man said? She's a beauty, all right, but Dobies are a lot of dog real dominant. They take a lot of training. The dog man looked me up and down. You tough, he said. What kind of question is that, I thought.
Baring the teeth is an obvious sign of aggression. When a dog is happy, its eyes can get wide and bright. A dog's face, like a human's, can express different emotions. Have you ever seen a pup with raised eyelids and a tilted head? That usually means it's puzzled or quizzical. The thing is, the dog man said, all dogs come down from wolves. They're what you call pack animals. A pack is like a family. Somebody's got to be in charge. You put an easygoing, wishy-washy kind of guy together with a real assertive animal, it's going to be the dog that runs the show. And that's not a pretty sight, the dog man said. At an early age, these pups learn their most important lesson. Living in a pack means knowing your place in it. Getting a sled team to work well together takes time and training. The strongest dog is accepted as leader of the team along with a human. The rest of the pack knows it's their job to follow the leader. So I'm walking along, trying to figure out what kind of a guy I am. Wild man or wimp? There was this little white dog trotting along with the rest of them, looking kind of like a crumpled Kleenex. I guess it was cute, but I just couldn't see myself with a dog that looked like that. The dog man nudged my arm. It's got nothing to do with size, he said. Some of the biggest dogs are the very gentlest. Have you ever wondered which was the biggest dog or the smallest? The Great Dane holds the record for tallest dog. The heaviest dog on record is a St. Bernard, even though Newfies are heaviest on average. And the smallest dog? The smallest on average is the Chihuahua. And some of those little guys, look out. They rule the roost. It's about attitude, the dog man said. A dog's as big as it thinks it is. I've met chihuahuas that thought they were bigger than King Kong. But size isn't everything, the dog man said. There's more, I said. Exercise, the dog man said. Some dogs are born jocks. You put an athlete with a couch potato, forget it. Nobody's happy. The dog man jerked his head towards the dogs. These guys, their owners can't make time to walk them, so they hire me. It's a good thing, too. Oh! <laughs> 
like humans, dogs need regular exercise to keep fit and healthy. If you turn exercise into a game, it's more likely to become something you and your dog will look forward to regularly. This is starting to sound a lot like work, I said. I thought having a dog was supposed to be fun. It is fun, the dog man said. And with a dog around, you'll never get lonely. Of course you want to make sure your dog isn't lonesome. Dogs get lonely, I said. Yup, he said. They're sociable animals, just like us. That's probably why we get along so well. Grooming is not just for looks. It can keep your dog healthy. This Cocker Spaniel didn't get the regular care it needed, so its matted fur will have to be shaved. Since dogs differ in their grooming requirements, be sure to find out what level of care your dog needs. One more thing you need to think about, the dog man said. What's that, I said. Hair, he said. A dog's coat needs attention. More work, I said. More fun, the dog man said. I made a mental note to keep my eyes out for a short-haired dog. If I got one with long hair, well, my sister's always messing with her doll's hair. Maybe I could convince her it's fun to groom a dog. Here's one thing all members of the dog family have in common. They shake. A shake starts from the head and creates a wave of motion that moves down the length of the body. Shaking is a self-grooming technique, like brushing your hair. So where do I find a dog, I said. Breeders, your best bet, the dog man said. They know their stuff. Of course, you could stop by the shelter and see who's there. Good dogs can have bad luck, you know. And those guys are already broken in. If you get a puppy, it can be a lot of work. I don't care, I said. I want a puppy. It was about the only thing I knew for sure right then. Before I headed home, I asked the dog man how come he knew so much about dogs. Before I retired, he said. 
I was a cop. My partner was a dog. You let me know how it all turns out, okay, kid? They come into the world blind, defenseless, and totally dependent. But a puppy will stand at two weeks, walk at three, and run by the time it's five weeks old. In a very short time, a puppy will begin to learn its most important social lessons through play. If you're pet shopping, consult these puppies. It's kind of like computer matchmaking. Except these guys help you get a dog, and not a date. When you're done, just click the contents button if you want to nose around on your own. Or click my picture if you want to take another tour. How much time will your dog be alone on an average weekday? Think about it. If you're the kind that stops by your apartment once a week what for he's, clean laundry... What, what, what he's trying to say is, you're never there. Busy, busy, busy. You might be better off with a pet rock. What kind of daily exercise will your dog get? You know, my owner and I have finally come to an understanding about the exercise thing. Well, what's that, Fist? I keep her company while she does the stair number. She climbs, I pant. <laughs> How much attention will you give your dog's coat? Oh, you know, I know a poodle has a standing appointment at the grooming salon. Goes once a month. <laughs> now, is, is, is that a boy or a girl, or does its hairdresser only know for what, sure? Now, what does that matter? It matters. If you're a girl, they give you a little pink bow. If you're a boy, you know, you got the, uh, blue. And now we have size. What size dog do you prefer? What is the biggest dog you ever knew? Um... Uh, it was a Bernese mountain dog named Clyde. He was so tall, his people didn't even put his bowl on the floor. He had his own table to eat off of. <laughs> At least it kept the kids out of his kibble, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I want my dog mainly to... Does your owner still take you hunting with him? Nah, 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 nah. I finally found a way to make him stop. What's that? 
I put a gun control sticker on the bumper of his 4x4. Ooh, very <laughs> cool fetch. Yeah, now I get to sleep on Saturday morning. <laughs> Here's an important one. How much experience do you have training a dog? Experience counts. Eh, uh, sometimes experience costs. You mean like uh, paying a professional trainer? Nah, nah, nah. I mean stuff like carpets, sofas, shoes. Let the buyer beware. Yes. My dog will live in... Lately, uh, I've been feeling a certain responsibility to the environment. I, I think we all should do our part to keep our planet clean. Yeah? So what's your part? Yeah, I figure if I eat the garbage, it'll keep the dumps from filling up. A truly inspired rationalization fetch. Hey, hey, I, I believe in recycling. Who will your dog need to get along with? Hey. Yeah. They ought to use the mailman test on this one. The mailman test. What is that? You, you know, you know. I want my dog to kiss the mailman. I want my dog to eat the mailman. Uh, that's mail person. Oh. You, you have a thing about the mail person fetch. It's like the most important event in your day. You're wrong. It's the fourth most important event in my day. Right after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. How much time will your dog be alone on an average weekday? Hey, fist. That's it. <laughs> All right, we're done. Now, we'll search our extensive database, and then you'll get our suggestions about the right dog for you, right? Right. And when the list comes up, click a breed to get the inside story. Here it goes. Hey, Portia! Move! I grew up! Oh. <coughs> Come on, Portia. Oh, don't lick my face. Okay? This is her, Portia. She doesn't like it when I sit up in my tree. Now, do you, girl? It took a lot of thinking and a lot of looking, but I finally figured out what kind of dog was right for me. If you want to meet Portia, click on my picture up in the corner. There she is, a Portuguese water dog. At least that's what she'll look like when she grows up. My mother likes her because she's different. All mom's friends have labs or goldens, your typical suburban dogs. My dad likes her because she doesn't shed. My little sister pretends she doesn't like her, but that's just because she's jealous. I got a dog and she didn't. Portuguese water dog. Who says a sheepdog can only herd sheep? Strong instincts tell these dogs that any moving animal is astray even one with feathers.
corny, huh? But it's true. I like Portia a lot. Partly because she's smart and frisky and has a sense of humor. She really does have a sense of humor. I know it sounds weird, but some dogs do. Mostly, though, I like her because she's mine. My folks say Portia even cries after I leave for school. Don't you, girl? The first time I saw her, she was only about a day old. Her hair was real short, and her eyes were closed all the time. None of her senses were up and running yet, so she had to find her mother just from her warmth. To tell you the truth, Portia looked more like a naked mole rat than a dog. I couldn't bring her home until she was almost two months old. The breeder said puppies get antibodies from their mother's milk, and they learn important dog stuff by staying with their litter. Did you know that just by playing with other puppies, dogs learn this whole body language thing that lets them live together without fighting? Cool, huh? Australian Cattle Dog. Herding dogs probably developed at the same time animals like sheep and goats were domesticated. Although almost every nation has its particular breed of herding dog, they all possess similar qualities. They're obedient, reliable, and hardworking. Puppies need shots, just like human babies do. Portia doesn't like them much. I never did either. But you can't take puppies anywhere until they get them all. Otherwise, they might catch some terrible disease. What makes a puppy trainable? The same instinct that keeps their wild relatives in a well-ordered pack. These African hunting dog pups are being trained to accept a dominant leader. Just like wild dogs, puppies need to have a leader for their pack, and humans work just fine. When the day came to bring her home, the breeder said, Ben, think of this puppy as a wild animal you're bringing into your home. 
You have rules, but she's got instincts. It'll help you understand her if you learn to think like a dog. Like humans, dogs have a well-established social order that they learn at an early age. Puppies first learn about pack hierarchy through play. Here's where they discover the rules of rank and territory and their place in the pack. I had a bunch of paper towels with me in case she got car sick on the ride home. But Portia turned out to be a good traveler. The windows were down, and she kept sticking her tongue out trying to lick the wind. Hey, if you don't have a crate, remember to fasten your dog's seatbelt when you take her for a ride. <laughs> Listen to me. I'm starting to sound like my parents. It was really cool showing Portia her new home. Because I'd done my homework, I knew what she was trying to tell me when she bowed down in front of me. Actually, in dog, it meant, hey, you want to play? Not, you're the king. My sister didn't know that, though. She got real upset when I suggested she might want to try it. Even though they can't speak like humans, dogs can communicate through body language. Rolling on her back is a sign that this dog feels content and safe. A stance like this says, I want to play. And these pups aren't fighting. Aggressive play is their way to figure out who's the leader. That night, though, Portia missed her mother and her littermates. And puppies don't wear diapers. You have to be really patient and really responsible when you're housebreaking them. I mean, you can't just put the pillow over your head and pretend it's not your problem. <sighs> I didn't get much sleep.
You may think your dog is misbehaving when she digs a hole in the backyard, but she's just following instincts inherited from her ancestors. This wolf stashes away food for later, the same thing a dog does when it digs a hole and buries a bone. Portia got to sleep in the next day, but me, I had to get up and go to school. I nodded off in English, and Mr. Pingree said, burning the candle at both ends, Ben? Whatever that means. He thought it was cool I'd name my dog after a character in Shakespeare, though. I wonder if it's worth an A. When I took her in for her first checkup, Portia was really scared. Actually, the vet said she was probably picking up some of that from me. Dogs are really sensitive to what people are feeling. Dr. Rogers knew how to calm her down, though. The vet showed me how to tell if she had cooties. That's a joke, get it? Remember in second grade when boys said girls had cooties and girls said boys had germs? Actually, dogs get fleas and ear mites and worms. Just thinking about it kind of makes your skin crawl. Did you know that humans and dogs can suffer from the same diseases? These dogs have a neurological condition called narcolepsy. Just like people who have narcolepsy, they periodically fall into brief attacks of REM, or dream sleep. Dr. Rogers even taught me how to do dog CPR. I've been thinking it would kind of be cool to be a vet if I could stand to stay in school that long. When I told my friend Steve that, he said, remember baseball, Ben? He was the one who said I was turning into a dog nerd. <coughs> Gotta run. Porsche's telling me it's time to play. Even healthy dogs need annual medical examinations. Preventative care, like vaccinations, can protect a pup from life-threatening diseases. And with the increasing surplus of unwanted dogs, you might want to consider having your dog spayed or neutered, as this one is. My pitching arm still works okay. Watch this. Okay, Porcha. Fetch! If you want to, you can play around here for a while or click the contents button. If you want to take another guided tour, click on my picture.
All dogs need to play, but it's important to choose the right kind of games. Frisbee and catch are good non-competitive games that let your dog chase, capture, and retrieve. Activities its instincts tell it to do. Oh, hi. I was just practicing my whistle. It comes in handy when you've got a dog. I got one a few months ago, and basically it's changed my life. My friend Steve says I've turned into a dog nerd, but he's pretty immature. I mean, if it's not baseball or rap music, he doesn't see the point. The point is, a dog's a dog. If you don't want to end up living in a kennel, you've got to teach it your house rules. Click my picture up in the corner, and I'll give you some tips. Tip number one. A dog is basically a wolf that's been hanging around with humans for a few thousand years. So if you let it do what comes naturally, it'll do wolf stuff. Like, say your folks are gonna barbecue, and they leave the chicken sitting out where the dog can get it. The dog is gonna steal the chicken. Your mom and dad are gonna be furious, and your dog won't have a clue why they're upset. The dog's a hunter, and he just scored big time. Wolf stuff. Ever wonder why a dog goes after the mail carrier day after day? This is a dog's chance to manipulate its environment. The mail carrier comes, the dog barks, the mail carrier goes away. Every day, the dog's behavior is reinforced. All part of a day's work. The good news is, wolves live in packs, and a pack is like a family. So when a dog moves in with you, it's like you just adopted it into your pack. A dog is perfectly willing to do what the leader of the pack expects. It wants to make you happy. That's kind of the basis of all dog training. I never thought of myself as a top dog before, but I've been learning. It's you anyway, Pee-wee. Shame on you! What did you do that for? I didn't buy them. No, but you tried to. It's bad enough picking on a straw man, but when you go around picking on poor little dogs... Think of your dog as a foreign exchange student. It's a culture clash thing. It sees a car speeding by. It thinks, oh, here goes a funny looking green gazelle. 
something that might be good for dinner. You've got to make your dog understand that in your culture, you don't chase cars or you end up being roadkill. Their methods may vary, but most successful trainers will agree on this. Dog owners need to be trained too. Understanding a canine's basic instincts makes training easier for you and your dog. Sit. No. Sit. Do it again. Sit. Sit. And stiff. Sit. Sit. That's right. Now start. That's right. Now push her back. Yes, but that was far too gentle. You see, to get dogs to do it quickly, you mustn't be soft. Come on. Stand up. No. Sit. You see? Yes. It is gentle, but it's quick. Now, I would like to have three more. Fortunately, dogs are really smart. Well, let's try this then. Can he add those two? And subtract? Well, he can do that for you in one operation. Barney, please add up nine and two and subtract two. What is the answer? Quite right. Now, is there any trick in all this? How's it done? No, I do assure you there's no trick whatsoever. Uh, my own personal belief is it's telepathy. They don't do fractions, but they can learn to do some amazing stuff. I mean, blind people trust guide dogs with their lives. And I'm not just talking about crossing a busy street. Blind guys go skiing with their dogs. Dogs help electricians do wiring. They find bombs. When they had that big earthquake over in Japan, it was dogs who helped find people buried in the rubble. German Shepherd Dog. Portuguese water dogs, like my dog, Portia, used to work on fishing boats. They were born to swim. They even have these webs between their toes, kind of like ducks. These dogs could put out nets and then herd fish into them. If a big one got away, no problem. They'd retrieve it. If it got foggy, they'd act like radar. Now that's smart. Portuguese water dog. And dogs in movies? Sure, the scripts make them look good, but basically, they really do do a lot of what you see on the screen. 
The thing is, their trainers break down those complicated routines into a bunch of simple steps, and the dog learns to do it one step at a time. Now don't tell my little sister, but the first time I saw old Yeller, I cried my brains out. Collie. Friendly, affectionate, and smart, all the qualities that make Lassie a star are typical of this breed. Rough-coated collies originated in the lowlands of Scotland. Bred to be agile and intelligent herding dogs, collies today are both useful workers and popular pets. The trick is, whether you want to teach a dog to sit or to skydive, you use the same basic cycle. Example, reward, repetition, correction. Example, reward, repetition, correction. Dogs love praise. Hey, I pitch better when the coach says I'm an ace than when he yells at me. Same thing with dogs. The other thing is, you should never punish a dog unless you catch it in the act. 90 seconds after it digs up the geraniums, it's forgotten the whole thing. So if you start yelling, it just thinks you're insane. The other big thing is, be consistent. Like, don't laugh when your dog jumps up sometimes and yell at it at other times, or it's only going to get confused. It's like when your parents tell you you have to get eight hours of sleep, and they also tell you you have to get all your homework done before you go to bed. So which rule do you follow? Dogs hate mixed messages as much as kids do. Look, it's almost time for baseball practice, and I've got to take Portia for a walk before I go. But here's some stuff you ought to think about getting, especially the crate. It's like giving your dog its own room, and it really helps when you're teaching your dog the bathroom stuff. Nobody does their business in their own room. Hey, gotta go. And about training your dog, hang in there. It's definitely worth the hassle. Remember, a trained dog is a happy dog. Got that? <whistles> hey, Portia, come on, girl. Good girl. Maybe we'll see you at a dog show one of these days. The way Portia's going, I'm thinking of entering her. If you want to explore on your own, click on the contents button. Click my picture if you want to take another guided tour. In the 1940s, a dog named Lassie helped make the rough-coated collie one of the most popular breeds in the world. A behind-the-scenes look at Lassie being trained shows the good-natured, affectionate, and extremely intelligent nature of the collie. my whistle. It comes in handy when you've got a dog. I got one a few months ago, and basically it's changed my life. My friend Steve says I turned into a dog nerd, but he's pretty immature. Tip number one. Oh, hi. 
I was just practicing my whistle. What's that you say? Come closer, child. My ears aren't what they used to be. Oh, don't worry about those dogs there. They're tame enough, <laughs> at least when they're asleep. Now, what did you want to know? About the dogs? Well, if you want to know about them, you've come to the right person. I may be an old woman, but I still know more than anyone else in this village about raising dogs. Been at it all my life. So click that picture of me up in the corner, and I'll tell you what I know about how humans first tamed dogs. Or at least some of it. Where to begin? Where to begin? You know, of course, that this land of ours is an ancient one. <laughs> Why, we were once part of a mighty Babylonian empire. No, child, <laughs> I never met Nebuchadnezzar. I may be old, but I'm not that old. What was I saying? Oh, oh, yes. Since the Babylonians, we've had the Egyptians, the Hittites, the Assyrians, uh, the Persians, the Greeks, and now the Romans marching through our fields with their dogs of war. But a thousand, thousand years before even Babylon was a twinkle in King Hammurabi's eye, we had dogs of our own. We've changed their size, shape, coloring, temperament, and personality. But looks aren't everything. Even the smallest, fluffiest dog has the mind and instincts of its ancestor, the wolf. I can't tell you who first got the idea of taming the wild animals that prowled just beyond our firelight. I like to think that long ago, a woman, maybe like me, found a litter of wolves of wild dogs, brought them into the village with her. Now before you go out looking for baby wolves or jackals, let me warn you, it takes more than just raising an animal with people to make it tame. Yes, indeed. Bring a wild pup into this village, and it'll probably grow up to kill the sheep instead of herd them. So how did these dogs get so tame, you ask? Well, it didn't happen overnight. It took many generations of carefully choosing only the gentlest, most willing to please pups from each litter. People wanted dogs that acted more like puppies, even when they were grown.
Wolves are social hunters working together to bring down game much larger than themselves. Domestic dogs were bred to be successful hunters by capitalizing on their wolf instincts. Scent hounds, for example, work in a pack to trail their prey until it's cornered. I can't imagine what life was like before we had dogs to help us herd the flocks or hunt wild game. And in this day and age, with barbarians sweeping down from the east, hungry Roman legionnaires marching in from the west, you can't be too careful. It doesn't hurt to have a little extra protection. Like, what? What? Come again. A big dog breathing down your neck, you say? Oh, don't mind him. That's just Caesar. You've probably noticed that huge fighting mastiffs like him are mighty popular with the Romans. In fact, Caesar there got left behind, didn't you, the last time a legion marched through here. But the Romans weren't the first to discover big dogs. Oh, no. The Phoenicians were trading mastiffs back when Rome was no bigger than this village here. Mastiff. But you know the Romans. Marching here, marching there with their big, great armies and conquering everything in sight. For the most part, the Romans just litter the countryside with dogs they don't need anymore. Just like old Caesar there. A blessing in disguise, I call it. Gives me new stock to experiment with. Right now, I'm considering mating Caesar to one of my grandson's running hounds, just to see what happens. I see plenty of strange things, let me tell you. Elephants from the east, caravans of traders from the south, bringing slaves and spices up from Africa. Even barbarian Huns now and then, I'm sorry to say, pillaging their way down from the north. And of course, they all bring their dogs with them. I can't imagine what animal fathered these dogs, if they are dogs. Briard. And I've heard there are even stranger looking dogs to the west. One tribe of barbarians, the Celts, seem to be uncommonly fond of dogs, especially if they're big <laughs> or red. Actually, it was tales of these Celtic dogs that gave me the idea of crossing Caesar with one of my grandson's dogs. From what I've heard about those giant dogs, they're just bigger, hairier versions of our own running hounds. Brittany. You know, the last time the Pro Council came through here, he had with him a dog that was about the size of a rabbit. My grandson tells me these small animals are very popular with Roman ladies. <laughs> a 
but I just can't understand what they see in them. They don't hunt, they don't herd, they certainly don't guard. So why bother? Italian Greyhound. Oh, wait, wait a minute, child. I have something to show you. Where did I put them? Caesar, move! Oh, here they are. This dog skull came from the east, from a land far, far over the mountains. To tell the truth, I'm not entirely convinced that it is a dog. Looks more like a monkey's head to me. Hmm. The other comes from Gaul. The skull of a wild wolf, I'm told. How different they are. And yet, and, oh, forgive me, child, but I'm old and I need my rest. If you'd like to prowl around on your own, feel free. Caesar will make sure no harm comes to you, won't you, Caesar? <coughs> Just click the contents button. Or if you'd like another guided tour, click my picture to return to the guide screen. Welcome, welcome. No, no, you're not disturbing me, child. I was just looking at this book my grandson, the merchant, brought me from Rome. Precious things, books. Not a lot of them in this part of Mesopotamia, let me tell you. This one's written by a Roman fellow. What? What's it about? Well, click my picture up in the corner and have a look for yourself. Pretty amazing stuff, really. Wild animals from all around the known world. Hmm, I'll admit this one isn't very wild. There's a whole pack of them sleeping right over there. Dogs like this have been around these parts since before King Nebuchadnezzar dreamed up the hanging gardens of Babylon. Still, you can see a kind of family resemblance to jackals. You never saw a jackal? Well, wait, I'll, I'll show you a picture. There's one in here somewhere. Here it is, bottom right. What I like about jackals is they mate for life. Yes, indeed. 14 or 15 years, a jackal couple might be together. Not like dogs that just flit from one mate to the next. Or some humans, for that matter. That red thing? Well, let me see. The book says it's a, a fox. Solitary hunter. Defends its territory from other foxes. Looks like a dog, but acts like a cat. Ho, ho, ho. These fellas remind me of a bunch of barbarians dividing up the loot after sacking a village. No, child, those aren't dogs. They're wolves. What? What's that you say? A wolf drooling on your shoulder? Nonsense. That's just my mastiff, Caesar. He's all bark and no bite. That's probably why those Roman legionnaires left him behind. You won't see wolves around here, but this book says there are great packs of them to the north and west. My grandson's seen him, though. As a merchant, you know, he travels a lot. He says there are two easy ways to tell a dog from a wolf. You can look at the teeth. Not even Caesar here has choppers to match the ones on a wolf. Or if you can get close enough, you can count the toes. Wolves don't have dew claws like dogs. 
What I say is, if you're close enough to be looking at its teeth or counting its toes, you better hope it's a dog and not a wolf you're looking at. <laughs> if I weren't so old, I'd make my grandson take me with him the next time he travels to Gaul. I'd give anything to see wolves. I heard they're enormous and smart, too. What's that? Have I ever heard of men who change into wolves? Well, yes, of course I've heard the stories. But then I've also heard that Helena Troy's father was a swan. <laughs> you shouldn't believe everything you hear. According to the myths of the American Indians, the coyote is one of the oldest spirits around. Legend has it, he has two unique powers. He can create what he can imagine, and he has the ability to be reborn. Besides, if I had to choose between a wolf man or a pack of these African wild dogs, I think I'd take my chances with the wolf. <laughs> Listen to what the book says about these beasts. There are more males than females in a pack, and only one pair does all the breeding for the whole group. Beagle. Oh, now here is a singing dog. Imagine, child. Looks a lot like the wild dogs that live around here, doesn't it? You know, I've heard tell this African dog sings too. Sounds just like women mourners at a funeral, they say. Basenji. Oh, hush, Caesar. There's nothing out there but a couple of those wretched pariahs. Pass me that rock, would you, child? Hey, hey, you, get away now. We hate them around here, but not everybody feels that way. I've heard that in parts of India, they don't dare harm one of them because the souls of the dead inhabit the dogs that eat their corpses. <laughs> Oh, don't look so worried. Dogs like those only go after dead people. And heavy sleepers, of course. <laughs> the real problem with wild dogs is that they get after your livestock, kill the sheep and the newborn cattle. That's one reason we keep tame dogs by us, to guard our flocks and drive the wild ones away. Not that this bunch is doing much. <laughs> hey, you dogs, wake up. <laughs> Well, child, I, I think I'd better just go and check up on the sheep. We've some new lambs, and I'd hate for those skulkers out there to get them. If you'd like to keep looking through my book on your own, click the contents button. 
Just try not to get fingerprints on the papyrus. But if you'd like another tour, click my picture. Who's there? Come into the firelight so I can see you. Oh, it's you, child. I was just remembering an old story about a ghost dog. Thought for a minute you were the ghost. What? Stories about dogs? Well, yes, I know a few. Why don't you sit down there by old Caesar? Don't mind him. He's a big dog, but he's old. Click my picture up in the corner there, and I'll tell you the tales my grandmother told me when I was young. Maybe a few that she never knew. Now you knew, of course, that our old Babylonian goddess, Gula, had a dog. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Her dog could heal, you know. A useful talent in anyone. I'm named for, as a matter of fact. The goddess, not the dog. And the Roman god of healing, Asclepius, was even raised by a dog. Dogs live in his temples and cure the sick and injured by licking them. But it's not just healing gods who have dogs. No, even the devil has a dog. If you want to see demon dogs, the Greeks will tell you to wait at any crossroads around midnight. Sooner or later, Hecate, goddess of the underworld, will pass by there in a chariot drawn by great black dogs. And they're not the only ones in India. They tell of a ghost that... Say, child, you look a little like a ghost yourself. Now, now, not all the dogs of the underworld are terrible. In Egypt, it was jackal-headed Anubis who led souls to the afterlife. That's not so bad, is it? Of course, if your soul wasn't as pure as it should be, Anubis fed your heart to a crocodile. Uh, perhaps I should change the subject. I've always liked that story about the flood and the boat with all the animals on it. In some tales, that boat sprang a leak and the dog plugged it with his nose. They say that's why dogs have cold noses. Reminds me of an African story I heard about how dog once stole meat, got struck across the nose with a hot poker for his trouble. <laughs> Poor dog stuck his snout into a pail of water, but the fire had burnt his nose black, and the water made it cold. Afghan Hound The Afghan Hound's elegant coat is not just for looks. It evolved as necessary protection against cold mountain temperatures. Look, look up there now. See that constellation? In Greece, that's Canis Minor, the little dog. Of course I know the story. Would I bring it up if I didn't? Once, there was a little dog named Mera, and she belonged to a fella named Icarus. 
The poor man was foully murdered and his body hidden. But the dog witnessed the crime and led the man's daughter to where Icarias's body was buried. That's an amazing dog, don't you think? Briard. You want to know what happened next? Well, you know those Greeks. They invented tragedy, after all. All right, if you really want to know. The poor girl hanged herself, and the little dog was set in the sky. Right next to Canis Major, as a matter of fact. Also called Sirius. And I'm not kidding. The hunter Orion's dog, you know. Italian Greyhound. And speaking of dogs in the sky, my grandson, he's a merchant, you know, been all over the known world, tells me that in the barbarian lands to the west, gods hunt the night sky with packs of ghostly hounds. Barbarians are great believers in ghost dogs. In those parts, they say anyone who gazes steadily from between a dog's ears will see ghosts and spirits, just as dogs do. Wanna try with Caesar? Gordon Setter. No, I didn't think so. You know, the Romans tell some pretty good stories about dogs, about wolves, too. Romans believe they're descended from two brothers who were raised by a she-wolf. Of course, the Greeks say their god Zeus was suckled by a she-goat. <laughs> and one Egyptian pharaoh claimed he was nurtured by an eagle. It's a funny thing, but I've never met a commoner who was reared by an animal. Have you? This might seem like an unusually smart canine, but he's actually just following his instincts. Instincts that have been redirected. Instead of rounding up stray sheep, this border collie has been trained to bring back stray tools. You could say he's a roofer's best friend.
some years back, a trader coming back from the Far East told me the most amazing story about a princess who married a dog. They had six daughters and six sons who all wore clothing made of tree bark with long, dangling tails down the backs. According to that trader, the descendants of this dog don't have to pay taxes to this very day. If it meant not paying Roman taxes, I'd swear Caesar here was my grandfather. You know, the Greeks say it was a man called Prometheus who brought us fire from the gods. But in Africa, they claim it was a dog. Well, child, I've spent a lifetime among both men and dogs. And the older I get, the more sure I am that the Africans were right. I'll wager that if you sailed to the far side of the earth, you'll find stories of gods and dogs there too. More stories? Gracious child, what an appetite you have. Certainly there are more, many more, but you'll have to discover them for yourself. Caesar and I have chores to attend to before we sleep, don't we, Caesar? If you want to find more stories on your own, click the contents button. Or if you'd like another tour, click the button with my picture in the corner to return to the guide screen. And those were all the guides. We're going to go back to the content section. Now we're going to browse around these uh, parts of the program. So let's start with breeds. Dachshund. Although it makes a good pet, the dachshund was actually bred for hunting badgers. A friendly game of catch shows off the dachshund's tenacity and hunting instincts. Irish Wolfhound. There is more evil around us here. going more in depth in the uh, dogs that the tour guides didn't go over. So if you see me skipping over some, it's because the tour guides had already touched on these dogs and you'll have to go back to the guides if you want to see more in depth um, facts. So I'm just trying to find the ones we didn't get information on.
Bassett Griffin von Dane. Bloodhound. You might think a dog with blood in its name would be fierce, but a bloodhound's more likely to kiss than to kill. You there let loose the pack! And you, my hunter at the door! Set the hounds on her. But, sir, you, you, you can't do them. The hounds! Let loose the pack! In the early 19th century, entertainments like racing horses or greyhounds were beyond reach of the working class, so common folks invented their own versions of upper crust sports. Shitsu. Chinese emperors like dogs they could Bulldogs are popular mascots. The English version is the symbol of Britain, while the American Bulldog represents the United States Marine Corps. <laughs> Pekingese. The People's Republic of China outlawed pet ownership to keep dogs and humans from competing for the same scarce food.
All wolves have long muzzles, but not all dogs do. Former President Ronald Reagan's fondness for Cavalier King Charles Spaniels helped make the breed popular in the U.S. French Bulldog. That cute little French Bulldog was developed from animals capable of killing bulls. Pug. When it comes to sports and politics, humans like to identify themselves with dogs. Lhasa Apso. Lhasa Apsos are sometimes called lion dogs, but they aren't the only dog to go by that nickname. Chihuahua. No matter how reduced its size, the Pomeranian still got a big spirit. Pomeranian. Northern breeds are best known for their stamina and strength. But there's another side to these hardworking animals. With their energy and affectionate dispositions, they can be devoted pets, always ready for a new adventure. A dog that looks like the Egyptian jackal-headed god arrived in Malta by way of Phoenician sea traders. Six thousand years ago, pharaoh hounds were desert dogs. Modern pharaohs still lick rainwater from each other's coats to make use of every precious drop. Japanese chin. Being clipped to resemble the Taj Mahal was not a dog's idea. <laughs> Bernie's Mountain Dog.
Without the ancient Romans, we might not have arches, concrete, or the Bernese mountain dog. Boxer. A good police officer is smart, brave, and knows what to do in a tight spot. That goes for a good police dog, too. In many cases, a dog is only as good as its owner. Strength and aggression make the Doberman an excellent guard dog. But it's also been trained as a retriever and sheep herder. To keep its sleek shape, a Doberman needs to get plenty of exercise. Doberman Pinscher. A leopard may not be able to change his spots, but a Dalmatian can. Over the thousands of years that humans and dogs have been together, hundreds of breeds have developed. Bull Mastiff. The Bull Mastiff may have been the first stealth weapon. Bred to approach its quarry silently, this breed had invaluable first strike capabilities. St. Bernard. War was hazardous to this breed's health. Only five of these dogs remained at the end of World War I and only eight after World War II. <laughs> Newfoundland.
only a handful of breeds can claim Canadian citizenship, but this select group includes some of the world's most popular dogs. The Newfoundland is the heaviest dog on average and can easily be mistaken for a bear. But despite its size, the Newfie is a gentle dog that can fit in easily with humans. Norwegian Elkhound. The more things change, the more they stay the same. The Norwegian Elkhound has barely changed at all in 6,000 years. Skipper Key. Dogs and boats may not strike you as a natural combination, but the fact is, dogs have a seagoing history that dates back to ancient times. Akita. A funeral for a dog? Don't laugh. As long ago as in ancient Egypt, whole families shaved their heads and eyebrows to mourn the death of a family pet. Samoyed. <laughs> Japanese breeds come in one of three sizes small, medium, and large. <laughs> Shiba Inu. Smooth Fox Terrier. Thank you. 
Although it's changed over the years, fox hunting is still a popular sport in many areas. When the chase is on, the pack works as one to follow the scent of the swiftly moving fox. Norwich Terrier. A dog's instinct to dig can be traced back to its early ancestors. Burying meals for later helped wolves survive when food got scarce. Welsh Terrier. Wherever the ancient Celts went, both dogs and stories seemed to follow. Australian Terrier. <laughs> Bull Terrier. Over time, aggression has been bred out of many formerly ferocious breeds. Bull Terriers are extremely powerful dogs. Although not all can ride a skateboard, Bull Terriers do need plenty of exercise and attention to stay fit and happy. Boston Terrier. In the 19th century, the word fancier was synonymous with gambler.
Jack Russell Terrier. Bravery is a terrier's middle name. <coughs> Miniature Schnauzer. Up until the turn of the century, a schnauzer was simply a pincher in an overcoat. Wire Fox Terrier. History speaks of explorers and adventurers, but do you know the names of their dogs? More than most hunting dogs, Lakeland Terriers understand that chasing prey can be a real blast. Yorkshire Terrier. Even the tiniest dog is a wolf in its bones and in its mind. Miniature Pincher. A Doberman may look like a grown-up version of the Miniature Pincher, but surprisingly there's no relation between the two. Both, however, make excellent watchdogs. Airedale Terrier. Ever since the ancient Assyrians began strapping pots of boiling oil to dogs' backs and sending them into battle, dogs have fought and died alongside their masters. Scottish Terrier. Most Terriers come from Great Britain, but not every Terrier in dogdom salutes the British flag. Where do Terriers come from? The President's official home, American headquarters for leaders of the United Nations. Here Mr. Roosevelt lives working long hours into the night. But when seven o'clock comes, here is one chap who usually gets his supper direct from the hand of the president. His name is Falla, a three-year-old Scotty, and the president's only pet. Falla's quite an accomplished dog and equally fond of his master. A rare and interesting glimpse into the human qualities of the man who is president of the United States. West Highland White Terrier. The white coats of hunters and guardians are more than just window dressing. <laughs> Kerry Blue Terrier. This need to identify with animal mascots is strong even today. Just look at your local sports team or your own country.
Cairn Terrier. Well, is that the witch? Oh, Toto? Toto's my dog. Which came first, the Irish, the Wheaton, or the Kerry Blue? Border Terrier. Border Terriers aren't the only dogs of indeterminate origin. Airedale Terrier. Ever since the ancient Assyrian <laughs> Russell's Griffin. Humans sometimes bob their noses for fashion's sake, but the Brussels griffin wasn't given a choice in the matter. Look into my eyes. You have a deep desire to go back where you belong. Pembroke Welsh Corgi. Comical as low-slung dogs may look, their short legs always serve a purpose. Pembroke and Cardigan Welsh Corgis began as farmhands that guarded homesteads, hunted game, and herded cattle. <coughs> Belgian Sheepdog Until the late 19th century, Belgian Shepherd Dogs were bred for their herding ability, not for how they looked. Old English Sheepdog Farmers began docking the tails of Old English Sheepdogs for economics, not aesthetics. This dog is showing off one of the trademarks of its breed, incredible energy. The stamina that made the Old English Sheepdog an excellent herder also makes it a lively and spirited pet. Briard. Great Pyrenees.
Because they're descended from wild hunters, dogs are natural predators. Once they were trained to round up animals rather than attack them, some became herding and guardian dogs. Early on, farmers saw the value of having white dogs in the field. White dogs stood less chance of being mistaken for a predator and accidentally killed. Shetland Sheepdog. The Shetland Sheepdog's size was determined by where it originated. Bouvier des Flandres. The name Bouvier means bovine herder. Australian cattle dog. The Australian cattle dog's bark is definitely not worse than its bite. Herding dogs probably developed at the same time animals like sheep and goats were domesticated. Although almost every nation has its particular breed of herding dog, they all possess similar qualities. They're obedient, reliable, and hardworking. How could these dogs be called anything else? Pointers actually find prey with their keen noses and then point it out to the hunter. Irish Setter. Red-haired dogs are as rare as red-haired people. Perhaps that's why flame-colored canines have figured in the mythologies of so many cultures. With its distinctive red coat, this is one of the most graceful and athletic of dogs. The Irish Setter can be traced back to 15th century Ireland, where it was a popular sporting breed.
Labrador Retriever. Although water retrievers originated in Canada, it was in England that they developed into the labs we know today. They say that curiosity killed the cat, but it's even more deadly if you're a duck. The Labrador is one of the most versatile dogs around. Although still popular with hunters, the lab's drug-sniffing abilities have made it a favorite of law enforcement officials. Flat-coated retriever. Because flat-coated retrievers have never been enduringly popular, they've escaped from some of the problems that plague more common breeds. The Curly's ringlets may look frivolous, but they function as an all-weather wetsuit. Portuguese Water Dog Fishermen considered their Portuguese water dog so valuable, it was illegal to harm one. <laughs> Chesapeake Bay Retriever. Throughout history, traveling people have taken their dogs with them. Some hunting dogs were bred to blend with their surroundings. Others were bred to stand out. Field Spaniel. Today's tiny toy spaniels started out as miniature hunting dogs. Joy Freer, who saved Sussex Spaniels from extinction during World War II, compared the tawniness of their coats to the color of lions. Gordon Setter. If you hear the baying of ghostly hounds ringing through the winter air, beware, the wild hunt is unleashed. Cocker Spaniel. Don't be fooled by its looks. This pup has the instincts of a keen hunter. Today, however, the Cocker Spaniel is best known as an affectionate pet. Vizsla. German wire-haired pointer. German short-haired pointer. Uh, 
Weimar honor. The Germans felt the same way about Weimaraners as the Chinese did about Pekingese. The dogs were too special for foreigners to breed. English Springer Spaniel. Springer Spaniels are indefatigable hunting dogs, even in the backyard. This pup might not know what she's looking for, but it doesn't look like she'll stop until she finds it. Golden Retriever. <laughs> Most dogs enjoy a swim. But water retrievers, like this Labrador retriever, go one step further. A favorite of hunters, a retriever can carry a dead bird in its mouth without taking a bite. Retrievers are gentle, loyal, and dependable pets, too. Invest your time in training a big dog and collect the dividend of a trustworthy companion. Don't be fooled by their looks. Poodles were once known as exceptional sporting dogs. Intelligent and friendly, poodles today are good pets and useful companions. Like this loyal guide, a poodle terrier cross who works as a walking aid for disabled adults. Today, puffin nests are off limits. If you're tired of vacuuming pet hair off the furniture, make your next dog one of the hairless breeds. <laughs> Here's one thing all members of the dog family have in common. They shake. 
A shake starts from the head and creates a wave of motion that moves down the length of the body. Shaking is a self-grooming technique, like brushing your hair. You'll either need to become an expert groomer or hire one if you have a dog that requires special coat care. Growing, grown, gone. Shedding dogs' coats include hair in all three stages. Most dogs live between 9 and 15 years. Sterilizing your pet and providing a balanced diet will help your dog live longer. A dash of puppy in every dog is the recipe for an affectionate and obedient pet. When they're not eating or sleeping, wolf pups are usually playing. At this stage, it's hard to tell the difference between wolves and domestic puppies. But unlike their wild relatives, domestic dogs remain playful, even as adults. True elegance demands perfect harmony among all the items of the feminine ensemble. For instance, a superb hairdo would be wasted if Milady walks a shaggy dog. So...
My human's smart as a whip. All I have to do is pick up my dish and she knows it's time for dinner. Well, let's try. Jumping out of airplanes might not be the most typical job for a dog, but canines have been performing different kinds of rescue operations for hundreds of years. Little Bo Peep is just the kind of shepherd who would benefit from a flock guardian. Next time you cook onions or drop a pair of dirty socks in the laundry, think about your dog's nose. It's many times more sensitive than yours. Here, over. Here, boy. Their methods may vary, but most successful... Because they require a high degree of aggression and intelligence, only certain breeds should be trained as attack dogs. Perfect obedience is a must. If the dog can't stop on command, it should not be trained to attack. And all attack dogs should be trained by a professional. A German Shepherd named Rin Tin Tin Away from you, catch up just at half step, drop back as he cuts in front of you. Good boy. With their instincts to work cooperatively in a social unit, that's it, good boy. Dogs are natural born helpers. Go on, go on, boy. By capitalizing on these instincts, Humans can teach dogs to be the eyes, ears, and even hands for people who need them. Dogs' superior sense of smell and their ability to go where humans cannot have made them essential to search and rescue efforts around the world. German Shepherds go through a ref We've changed their size, shape, coloring, temperament, and personality. But looks aren't everything. Even the smallest, fluffiest dog has the mind and instincts of its ancestor, the wolf. Sure, I'll miss the sheep, but I'm going for my degree in search and rescue. Adding fresh stock keeps the gene pool from getting stagnant and protects dogs from inherited health problems.
Some dogs need to lead, but most need a strong leader. <laughs> Wolves are social hunters, working together to bring down game much larger than themselves. Domestic dogs were bred to be successful hunters by capitalizing on their wolf instincts. Scent hounds, for example, work in a pack to trail their prey until it's cornered. A pit fighter can be a loaded weapon or... North America isn't responsible for many breeds, but it has excelled at sled dogs. Raccoon hunting was once a top sport in many parts of the southeastern United States. Coon hounds could follow a trail for hours, covering large areas of countryside. Basenji translates to bush thing. The breed was named by the woman who first brought them to England in 1936. Nomadic desert peoples from North Africa to the Middle East have long depended on sight hounds to help them survive. Like most canines, these African hunting dogs live and hunt in a pack. Their large ears help them hear audio cues from each other during the hunt. Working together like this means there'll be plenty of food for all members of the pack. The history of herding and sheepdogs can be traced as far back as 1000 BC, when farmers began to breed large numbers of sheep and cattle. Although different varieties of herding dogs emerged, they all were hardworking, loyal, and intelligent, qualities they still possess today.
Our senses shape our perceptions of the world. A dog's reality is dramatically different from our own. To learn more about it, take the following quiz. There's a treat at the end. Pro That's right. Light reflected off a structure called the tapetum lucidum has a second chance of being detected by the light-sensitive cells, or rods and cones, in the retina. This enhances night vision. It also makes dogs' eyes appear to glow in the dark. Thousands of taste buds on a dog's tongue send chemical data to the brain for analysis. The brain processes the information and gives its verdict instantaneously. That's right. The back of the tongue hosts thousands of taste-sensitive nerve endings. Touch information relies upon physical contact between an animal's body and the surrounding environment. The brain decides whether the contact brings pleasure or pain. <coughs> Correct. Animals hear because disturbances in the surrounding air exert a series of rapid touches on the eardrum. Know how a stuffed-up nose keeps you from tasting dinner? Even though in mammals, taste has its own special apparatus, it's greatly enhanced by input from other senses. <coughs> right. Dogs learn less about food value than humans do from how something looks. Smell and texture are important information, though, when it comes to deciding what's good to eat. Scent information may be days old. Its source might be a mile away. But the data that comes from touching is very much about the here and now. That's correct. Dog skin, like ours, is a sense organ that collects information about the immediate environment.
Guau, guau. And that concludes this playthrough of Microsoft Dogs. I hope you enjoyed. I learned a lot. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below sharing your thoughts. And of course, if you're new, why not subscribe for more nostalgic content? Check out the playlist in the description box to see the other Microsoft learning games. So far, I have Dangerous Creatures and Oceans up there, and more are coming soon. Remember, you are special and loved, you are never alone, and you're always welcome to come back and hang out anytime. Until the next video, God bless. I'll see you all later. Bye-bye, my friends.